Sports Talk on a Thursday afternoon. Brendan Dorzinski, Dan Lucero, Spencer Dupuis. What have you people done with the Kansas City Royals? They have already, on April 11th, tied their longest winning streak from a year ago at seven straight back-to-back sweeps. They swept the homestand. And they have the third best record in the American League. A winning homestand is a good homestand. Yes. A five and two homestand would have been fabulous. Yes. Six and one would have been amazing. Seven and oh on the homestand. When the Royals won their ninth game last season, the number in the loss column was 26. <laughs> Pretty good. Today, the number in the loss column is four, and the number in the win column is nine. It is the third best record in baseball, and on their current form, this is not a fluke. This is precisely how well the Kansas City Royals have been playing to start this season. We will get to more from today's game here in just a second. We'll talk some more Royals baseball in the five o'clock hour of the show. Also, this hour, we've got what is wrong with you. We've got our final Big 12 breakdown of the college basketball season with C.J. Moore coming up here in a little bit. And we've actually got some Big 12 hoops to talk about because Scott Drew said no. He turned down Kentucky. I can't believe it. He actually did it. The mad lad turned down Kentucky. We'll talk to C.J. Moore about that. We also had a national on Monday. We'll talk to C.J. about that coming up at the bottom of this hour. Also today, we've got our 580 Sports Talk headlines. As I said, more Royals baseball, Scott Drew. All that coming up today on 580 Sports Talk. You are welcome to be a part of the show as well. You can hit us up on the YouTube stream, 580 Sports Talk on YouTube. Now just 23 subscribers away from 500. If you haven't subscribed, now is the best time to 580 Sports Talk on YouTube. And you can drop us a line on the Top City Metal Supply text line, 785 272 Nine four two nine. The Royals put up nine runs in the first inning today. It was nine nothing. They chased Astro starter Hunter Brown before he even got out of the first inning. They were mashing all over the place. And I want to give you a little history for Bobby Witt Jr. today, who went deep twice. He today had two home runs, scored four runs, had four total hits, five RBIs, and stole a base. He is just the third shortstop ever to put up that line not in the 2000s not in the live ball era no ever in baseball history can you name the other two who have done it um i'm gonna say only if you saw baseball reference also retweet this earlier i did not i did not see this so i am just gonna guess that it's troy to no, uh, both actually way more modern than Lou Boudreau. Hanley Ramirez in 2014. Sure. And your boy, Craig Wilson, back on September 14th of 1998. The only other two players to ever do it. Fun fact about those guys, they were both 28 or older. <laughs> Bobby Witt's a child. Fun fact about, is that uh, K-State Craig Wilson? Uh, it might be. Or am I thinking of somebody else? It is. Uh, Craig Wilson, no. same year. No, okay, different one. No, no, I'm thinking of a different, uh, maybe a different Wilson altogether or a different Craig. Uh, well, actually, hold on here. No, you are indeed thinking of the right one, Craig Wilson, who played in 1998. The other Craig Wilson didn't debut until 2000. Huh. So, yes, K State Craig Wilson playing for the Chicago White Sox in 1998. He only played 13 games that whole season, two of his three home runs came in the same game. <laughs> He was the September call-up. Man, that's an all-time Strato card if you can get it. 53 plate appearances, a 468 batting average, and a 1.256 OPS at shortstop. In uh, in status pro baseball, we call players like that boneheads. <laughs> 1256 OPS and 53 plate appearances. I believe those players are called, those cards are unleashed <laughs> in, the, uh, in the vernacular of uh, Stratomatic. So that is the history that we are talking about with Bobby Wood Jr. And granted, is that cherry picking? Yes, of course it is. But if you don't want to cherry pick the stats, think of it this way. 
Your third year shortstop just had two home runs, four hits, four runs scored, five runs batted in, and a stolen base in one game against a team that, while they are struggling to start the year because of all the injuries they've got, specifically to their pitching, one of the teams that is considered among the best in baseball, the Houston Astros. He's playing like a superstar, man, which is what he is. He is. And uh, what he is getting paid to be. It, uh, it's it's exciting to watch. It's, it's exciting to watch all of them. And look, it is not that long ago that we can recall a fun April for the Kansas City Royals. You don't have to go too far back into the archives because they were 16 and 9, I believe, through the end of April in 2021. Mm-hmm. We know that season did not end with a parade at Union Station. Uh, in fact, things got progressively worse from there. Here's the thing about that. In that impressive start that the Royals had, Back in 2021, that April where they were winning games and people wonder, hey, wait a minute. Maybe the Royals have turned over a new leaf. And no, they hadn't. They were they were crappy. Uh, They were outscored while they were starting 16 and nine. They gave up more runs than they scored in that stretch. This Royals team is plus 39 in the run differential department. If you just look at the last 11 games. So take out the first two games of the season, conveniently both losses, but mm-hmm. still. They're 9-2 and two since then, and they are plus 46 in run differential in those 11 games. They have scored 70 runs in their last 11 games and limited their opponents to just 24 runs. According to Randy Gisarely of Twitter and baseball writer fame, Randy Gisarely of Twitter, uh, <laughs> according to his Twitter, uh, that is the best run differential over an 11-game stretch for the Royals. Since 1977, any old timers remember what the Royals did in 1977 or almost did? Damn you, Chris Chambliss. <laughs> they're pretty good. Yeah, they were a pretty good team. Uh, so what the Royals are doing right now, we talked about it when they started three and four through the first week. I said, look, I know it's frustrating to be three and four. Bullpens let a couple of games get away, but it's a good sign generally when you win big and you lose close. You know, it's even a better sign when you win big and quit losing. Because that's what the Royals have done since then. They have been incredible. They have guys who are stepping up. We have seen Bobby Witt Jr. continue to cement his superstar stat. Guys who have been crushing. You to do so. Melendez to big hit in that first inning. You know who else is heating up at the right time? And why freaking out about it was probably not smart by anyone who was freaking out about it. Vinny Pasquantino. Yeah, Vinny, well, Vinny's alive. Yeah, he has been smashing the ball in the last couple of games. What was the stat they shared on the TV broadcast today that he had no RBIs through seven games and now has eight in the last three or something? No, he has eight in the last two. Eight like, in the last two, Those yeah. are his first RBI of the season, and he's got eight of them in the last two games. Now he's third on the team in runs batted in. Yeah, he has just been fantastic as of late. It has been awesome to see for the Kansas City Royals. We'll talk about some more Royals baseball later on in the show. Had some thoughts today from the YouTube comments. Again, 580 Sports Talk on YouTube. Vance says, who kidnapped the original Royals and replaced them with whoever's out there now? And Mark adds on to that totally different team. Yes, in the best way possible. Uh, we also have a uh, couple comments here. Um, one, in terms of history, Christopher, what was everyone doing June 2nd through 8th, 1998? A seven 88. Game, 88, yeah. Um, I would not be alive for more than six more years. Spencer would not be alive for another... Nine. Nine years. I was, You were barely alive. I was, uh, yeah, I was short of two years old, yeah. And uh, Jeffrey also says, sweet win for KC. Should have saved a couple of runs for tomorrow. Yeah, I got a Mets series coming up. Might not need too many to beat the Mets. That's from the Top City Metal Supply text line from the 785. This has been crazy. Like, I still feel like I need someone to pinch me. It's been so fun to watch. It's been a blast. How long has it been since you were, like, it was one thing when they were winning those games in in, uh, in 2021 to start the year. And that was a good time. That was a fun April. But, again, they were being outscored during that stretch, which means they were winning a lot of close games. And when they weren't winning, they were getting beat. They were getting drummed. Now they're doing the drumming. They had three innings, single innings, over the course of this homestand where they scored seven or more runs, including their nine-run first inning today. That is the definition of fun. If you were the type to live and die by Royals baseball, you didn't have to sweat a drop after the conclusion of the first inning today. Yeah, it's awesome. Maybe a little when Nick Anderson came in, walked in a run, had the bases loaded in the sixth. But I, it was still nine to three at that point. Like, 
this has been really, really enjoyable. And there are a lot of, and we'll get into more of them later, a lot of things that suggest that this is a little bit more legitimate than just like in comparison to the last time we saw the Royals have an April like this. What an awesome blast. We'll talk some more Royals baseball a little bit later on. Coming up next, we've got today's What is Wrong With You. Then CJ Moore will join us in this abbreviated 4 o'clock hour of 580 Sports Talk. with your time on this shortened edition of 580 Sports Talk with Brendan, Dan, and Spencer. Thanks for hanging out with us today following that Royals win over the Astros. TJ Moore will join us here in a few minutes, but first, we've got today's What is Wrong with You? Our winner for the week! <laughs> Would you like to, to remind us of yesterday's story? Yeah, the Polish priest who threw an orgy and had somebody pass out and almost die because he took too many uh, erectile dysfunction pills. The priest was sentenced for sexual offenses, supplying drugs, and failing to provide assistance to a person in danger of loss or of life. That's quite a crime. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what the... I'm I'm not real familiar with uh, the penal code in Poland, but... Uh, <laughs> maybe that's the name of this one, the penal code. I was just going to ask, what are we naming this? The priest's penal code. The penal code. <laughs> I, well, it's, it reminded me of the, that Simpsons episode where Homer goes to the library and says, I need the phone book for Hokkaido, Japan. And the guy <laughs> reaches under the desk and plops it in front of him and says, here you are, the phone book for Hokkaido, Japan. Like, you think if I go to the Shawnee County Library, yeah, I'd like to see the Polish penal code right there under the desk. Maybe. Maybe they have it. Who knows? All right, two new stories for today. Did you go first yesterday or die? Uh, I think I went second. All right. Go ahead, then. I'll go first today. Uh, you ever been three wheeling? Ever been on a three wheeler? I have this one. I had this one saved in case we needed it tomorrow. Spencer, you, you're you grew up and in, uh, in a part of the country where you know you do a little bit more, maybe some three wheeling ATV in. Not in Northern Virginia, no. Not in Northern Virginia. Okay, that might be a Southern Virginia thing. <laughs> Fair enough. Or a West. Virginia hey, li- listen, I have people who assume because I'm from Colorado, oh, you must have done all the mountainy stuff. Like, yeah, the mountains are like a drive. Like, I, lived, <laughs> I lived in the suburbs. So I, so I understand, and I apologize for having made the assumption. Anyway, uh, 49-year-old Anna Louise Keller of Seminole, Florida, was out three-wheeling the other day. Here's the problem. She wasn't on an ATV. She was in a Nissan Rogue, which, <laughs> as you may be aware, is a sport utility vehicle generally operating on four wheels I, i'll tell you this much my nissan rogue would be in the shop immediately if i only had three wheels 
So Keller uh, was driving a dark gray Nissan Rogue recklessly with no passenger side front tire. There were many 911 calls in response. Deputies spotted Keller driving south on Hamlin Boulevard in Seminole. Deputies conducted a traffic stop to conduct a welfare check. When they spoke to Keller, they smelled alcohol. She admitted to drinking and told deputies she was unaware that the tire was missing. I don't know how you could drive a four-wheeled vehicle and not be aware that you were missing a tire. Okay, I saw a vi- video. I It wasn't that. It couldn't have been the same person because it was a man. Um, driving and somebody like in the passenger seat of another car, like videoing them and trying to like, wave at them because their one tire was literally it was gone it was scraping like it was just scraping Hmm. i mean here's the answer you are so drunk you do not know where you are so she blew a 0.16 which is uh twice the legal limit also failed a field sobriety test deputies found four empty bush light beers in a bag (laughs) on the passenger side of the SUV. You can order that by name at a West Virginia drinking establishment. Just drive up and ask for the Bob Huggins. I was going to say, was she driving with Huggy Bear? <laughs> Keller was Even right. on the floor of the car. Bob had totally ruined his reputation even more ever since then. Uh, yeah, this. how do you not know? How do you not feel yourself rocking back and forth in the car or scraping or anything else. Yeah. yeah I, I would have guessed more drunk than that, to be honest with you. I agree. We we've had worse. We have. <laughs> oh yeah, we have. All right. For my story, we're going to Pulaski County, Kentucky, where a Southern Kentucky man admitted to faking his death, which we've had before. You have to avoid, you know, going to jail or something else. Well, this real winner decided he didn't want to pay child support. So he faked his own death. 39 year old Jesse Kipp, pleaded guilty to computer fraud and aggravated identity theft. Back in 2023, he used a computer to access Hawaii's death registry system, where he created a fake death certificate for himself. His plea document says he did this to avoid paying child support fees of more than $100,000. Mr. Kip, did you ever consider just paying child support when it was due and not racking up fees of more than $100,000? He also hacked other government and business networks to steal credentials. He was initially charged with multiple counts of computer fraud and identity theft, but thanks to his plea deal, was able to drop many of them, now just one charge of each. He owes over $200,000 to the various industries or various agencies, excuse me, that he wronged. Well, n- nobody asked him what if his child had bad vibes or was just unpleasant to be around. Here's the thing. Like many of the crimes we come across in this segment, you know what would have been easier than hacking into multiple government agencies and coming up with fake death certificates and going to court and possibly to jail and owing $200,000, just paying the child support in the first place? Yeah, that's that's not the kind of thing you want to get behind on. No. I, I would say no. Don't have kids with guys like this. That's my that's my piece of advice for today. All right, who wins today? Uh, I'm going to go with the guy who faked his own death. Uh, presumably, he did not do that under the influence. I yeah. would agree with that. that. That's ex- very extreme. Agreed. It does not win for the week. No, nope, <laughs> nope. <laughs> not even that close. one's. That that one is minus two fifty to win the month. The, I think the <laughs> Cialis cleric, the Viagra Viagra vicar, yeah, uh, the uh, the pill popping priest, yeah, yeah the, the penal uh, code. <laughs> Paul in the YouTube chat yesterday called it the preach around, which I I don't so <laughs> extreme. <laughs> I okay. Paul is very funny. I don't. <laughs> I in, don't know if we can stick with that name. Did you see the name that he named uh, the three-wheel car? The 2025 tricycle from Huggins Nissan. Man, Paul's been on fire in the YouTube comments. <laughs> that is, though, our winner for the week again here on What is Wrong With You. CJ Moore, he'll join us next for the Big 12 Breakdown on 580 Sports Talk.
Really quickly before we get to CJ Moore, a reminder to head over to our website, 580wibw.com, and enter the Alpha Media Choose Your Trip contest, your keyword for the 4 o'clock hour, community, C-O-M-M-U-N-I-T-Y. Head over to 580wibw.com, click on Choose Your Trip, enter the keyword. It is active until the start of the 5 o'clock hour. And with that, we are now joined for the final Big 12 breakdown of the college basketball season by our good pal C.J. Moore, who covers college hoops for The Athletic. His Twitter handle is at C.J. Moore Hoops, and he joins us here on the Fleming Place Wine and Spirits Hotline. Kind of hard to believe, C.J., that the biggest story in college basketball this week is not that we had a national championship game literally just three days ago. That's I'm not sure I followed you. You can't believe it's been only three days? Well, I can't believe that the fact we just had a national championship, and that's not even the biggest story in college basketball. It's the oh. the, the situation, I guess you can call it, going on in Kentucky right now. Yeah, yeah. The uh, my, my friend Kyle Tucker put it best. Um, great for John Calipari to uh, somehow overshadow the um, – <laughs> Final eight, final four that he hasn't been into in eight years or something like that. <laughs> so um, it, it has become a, a huge story and, and consumed us in the college basketball world these last couple of days. But um, <clears throat> hopefully they'll get some closure at some point. I mean, somebody's going to say yes to Kentucky at some point, right? Yeah, they, they, w- they will start next season with a head coach. I am confident saying that. We will get to the national championship game in the final four here in just a few moments. But we've got to start with this situation at Kentucky, especially because it's got a Big 12 tie. First things first, though, I mean, how surprised were you, CJ, that John Calipari leaves Kentucky for Arkansas? It was pretty public knowledge that the relationship between Cal and and maybe Mitch Barnhart or or just the university had become a little strained over time, but it felt like that move really came out of nowhere. I'm I'm not that surprised because um, there's been whispers in the college basketball world the last couple of years that Cal has been trying to find a way out. Um, every time there's a big job that opens, whether it was Texas, Michigan, there's all these rumors that Cal's interested in that one. Cal's interested in that one. I think this is just the first time that there's been mutual interest. And, um, yeah, and, and the timing was probably right because, um, as we wrote in the athletic, you know, he was, he was looking to once, once Mitch Barnhart came out and had the press conference with, um, Stoops a year ago, you know, when, when Cal had said it's a basketball school and, and the football program took exception to that, he, he knew that like it was probably time for him to move on. And, um, you know, their, their relationship was kind of beyond repair at that point. So as for the opening at Kentucky, because, I mean, if you're Arkansas, you're feeling great. You got a guy who won a national championship who it's been a while, but he's been to Final Fours. You want to keep saying, hey, we're one of the best jobs in the country. You went out and you got a Hall of Fame coach. For Kentucky, mm-hmm. How realistic, because it's sort of been accepted or it's been reported, and OKSR had some stuff out there among other people that, you know, they were aiming for Danny Hurley, who just won another national title. Obviously, Scott Drew maybe waiting out Billy Donovan in this season with the Chicago Bulls. How realistic is it that a name that big or with that kind of gravity would consider the Kentucky job at this point? Obviously, a couple have already turned it down, but do you feel like those were ever realistic expectations for Kentucky? Yeah, I mean, I, I think Scott Drew is the guy that the, the athletic director wanted for a long time and was always going to be his first target. And I think, um, you know, the last couple of days, Scott really thought about it and, and considered it. Um, and then, you know, just came to the conclusion today that he, he was not going to go. Um, but, it, you know, when Kentucky calls, when Kansas calls, when North Carolina calls, you, you know, you listen. And I, I think he actually considered it. Um, but now they're, they're moving down the road, um, you know, obvi- or down the list. Obviously, <laughs> Dan Hurley has, has made it very clear to multiple people that he is not interested. A um, pretty funny uh, little scene at the Final Four right after he wins the national championship game. He comes out of this press conference. I, I kind of intercept him and shake his hand and then, uh, my my friend uh, Kyle Tucker, who's who covers Kentucky for us, is is holding his laptop with it open in one hand, and has his tape recorder in the other, and kind of 
tries to get with Dan is walking very quickly with him. And, and it's like, I just got to ask you this one question. I'm sorry for the timing of it. <laughs> <laughs> Asked him if, uh, if he would have any interest in Kentucky, because there were some big donors that had a lot of interest in him and, you know, would basically write, almost give him the blank check. So, um, you know, not going to be Hurley, not going to be Scott Drew. If I had to bet on it, um, I think there is a coach in the Big 12 who who could very well end up at Kentucky, and uh, that's that's Mark Pope. So that I, I feel like the next guys they're going to get to are probably Mark Pope, and, and maybe, just maybe, they, they decide to uh, go to Rick Pitino because uh, I'm sure that would get their fan base plenty fired up, and I'm sure Rick Pitino would have a lot of interest. We're talking to C.J. Moore of The Athletic on the Fleming Place Wine and Spirits Hotline here on 580 Sports Talk. This is the Big 12 Breakdown on the program. C.J. covers college hoops at The Athletic. Find him on Twitter at C.J. Moore Hoops. Let's talk about Mark Pope then as a candidate at Kentucky. Obviously played there, played for Patino, won a national championship as a player there at Kentucky. He's had a coaching career that... uh, he started, I, I think he started in the NBA. I think I seem to remember him being an NBA assistant for a bit. Uh, he was uh, he was a mid major guy. Got the BYU job. Got them to the tournament this year. Uh, they were very competitive in their first year in the Big Twelve. He's one of their own there at Kentucky, but certainly the resume doesn't stand up to Scott Drews or Danny Hurley's. Do you think it's a fit? Do you think that works for Kentucky? That that would be a hire ultimately that. BBN could live with, uh, given his relative lack of uh, resume and tournament experience? I don't think it would, would win the press conference. Um, I think that you'd have a you know decent size of their fan base that kind of like feels like it's not enough and not big enough name. Um, but I do think he is one of the better up-and-coming coaches out there. Um, very modern approach to offense. Very, very, you know, this, like it's fun to watch BYU. It's not always been fun to watch Kentucky these last couple of years. Um, you know, and he's been recruiting with a very limited base and and who he can go get um, be, because you know, v, BYU is a um, a unique situation. So um, I do think that uh, he'd do a pretty good job. I, I'm not. I don't know that it's a given that he would go because he is Mormon and I I'm sure he feels a strong tie to BYU. Um, but you know, I think they could get to a point where, where that's the guy they target. I was going to ask you about his strengths as a coach. You kind of spoke to that, what they do offensively. They were very reliant on three point, uh, success and they had a lot of good shooters. So that worked for them. Uh, they, they shot a lot of threes, but they also ran some really neat half court stuff. They had Ali Khalif out there looking like an Egyptian Nikola Jokic at times. What do you like uh-huh. about the stuff BYU runs and, and the stuff that, that Pope runs as far as, uh, as far as what he could bring to a, an even higher profile job? Uh, they, you know, they play with a lot of pace. They're, they really, really try to get out in transition. They hunt a lot of threes. Um, and then, yeah, as you said, it like the, their their stuff is just it's it's pretty you know it has flow to it. Um, they run they play with pace in the half court too. Like there's a lot of moving and cutting. Um, it's just good basketball. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, you haven't seen a ton of that in Kentucky. Uh, the, you know, Kentucky was a lot more fun this year. I actually think offensively um, they were better, but um, you know, X's and O's have not been Calipari's forte these last few years. So I want to pivot back to Calipari, too, because as you mentioned, his offensive uh, scheme has been derided as being a little bit archaic. And I think they modernized some things this year and played a little faster than they have in recent years. But still, we are now in, in an age where Calipari hasn't seen the second weekend of the NCAA tournament since before COVID. Arkansas is coming off of a stretch under Eric Musselman, obviously, to make the tournament this year. They went to three straight sweet 16s under Eric Musselman. So the expectations will be high with Calipari going to Arkansas. How likely is it, you think, that he'll meet those expectations as the head coach of the Hogs? Uh, it's, hard, it's hard to say. It's, you know, is, is he going to um, continue to just have really, really young teams, or is he going to – um, mix in some transfers and have you know some older guys as well and, and be able to develop guys I don't know it's hard, it's hard to say um, he is pretty stubborn and um, I do think you know if he thinks the, that 
recruiting the youngest guys and, and going for the NBA talent is the best way, um, then he'll probably continue to do that. And, and I think it'll just depend on, um, you know, some years that's Anthony Davis and, and some years it's, um, and I don't know, you know, I, I can't come up with one off the top of my head, but there's, there's been years when those freshmen aren't near. Scal, Scal, Le- Le- this year. Yeah. Yeah. Scal, Le- this year. There you go. <laughs> some years it's Scal, Le- this year. Um, so we'll see, but I do think he'll be able to continue to recruit and get some, some high level dudes there. Um, which, you know, I'm sure Arkansas fans will be excited about for a while until it doesn't work in the NCAA tournament. We're chatting with CJ Moore from The Athletic, college basketball writer for The Athletic and TheAthletic.com. He joins us every Thursday during the college hoop season for the Big 12 breakdown on the Fleming Place Wine and Spirits Hotline here on 580 Sports Talk. I mentioned we had a national championship game this week, CJ, and UConn just, they did their thing. It was competitive for about a half, and then they hit the gas and stepped on Purdue's throat, and that was it. And they win every game in the tournament two years in a row by 13-plus points. I mean, you can go down stat for stat, stat, or fact after fact. They're all incredible about this run the last two years for UConn. What impresses you the most, CJ, when you have watched that team the last couple of years just on the floor for 40 minutes? What impresses you the most and do you think leads to this overwhelming success they've had? Just the relentless pursuit of winning every single possession and not really ever letting off. Um, you know, they they are one of those teams that, like, you, you want dominant teams, right, to keep their, their foot on the gas, and, and that is what they do. And um, it's, it's a testament to them and their staff. I think they are always very well prepared, um, always have a good plan, and they execute it, and their talent. Um, these last couple of years has been been really really good. I think that they they were, I think especially this year this team was like built um, just about ideally the way you want to build a college basketball team. They had old guys who knew how to play. You mix in a couple younger guys who were lottery pick type talents, and you know really defended, really shot the ball well um, from deep, and uh, just knew how to <laughs> execute a game plan. So um, well coached just all, all around, um, you know, almost the perfect college basketball team. And that's why we, we saw them do, you know, have a historic run. The strategy that Hurley was more than willing to talk about after the game, all of his players were willing to talk about it after the game. It pretty much boiled down to, yeah, we know ED can get his and we'll allow that to happen, but we got to shut down everybody else. Obviously with the benefit of hindsight, well, yeah, it worked out pretty well. UConn won the national championship game by 15 points, but in terms of the execution, it's easy to say that it's harder to actually execute it. Was it again, simply that, that mindset, that relentlessness that allowed UConn to shut down the Purdue guards, or was there something else that made that such a favorable matchup for the Huskies? Well, I, I think they really executed the plan. Um, well and and i mean it helps a lot when you have someone like donovan Klingon who um was really the first i mean he did get four fouls but the fact that he played as many minutes as he did and, and just had four fouls against zach ed is that's a accomplishment in itself and he you know the faith that they had in him allowed them to just stay tight on the perimeter and then also you know physically they just were bigger stronger faster than the purdue guards and, you know, as tight as they were guarding them, you would ideally like the way you beat that pressure is to attack it and, and you know, get into the paint. But like, that's just not what the Purdue Dars outside of Braden Smith were built to do. Um, so, you know, that's why I think the plan was a really smart one for them. You know, most teams don't have a guy um, that you can just put one on one against Edie and hope for him to at least make it tough and not foul. And, you know, or sorry, UConn kind of had a cheat code and, and Donovan Klingon. I think he was the most um, valuable defensive big man in college basketball because we're, of that. We're joined by CJ Moore of The Athletic here on the Fleming Place Wine and Spirits Hotline. And CJ, looking forward to next season, who would be an early team you think is going to compete for a national championship? Well, our, our preseason top 25 is out. I encourage you guys to all go view that which uh, is not a very easy exercise this time of year because we don't really know what rosters are going <laughs> to look like but uh we know duke is is going to be super super talented we'll see which of their experienced guards return but they should have some experience on the perimeter um they got cooper flag coming in um I, they have uh i think the number two player in the class who's a big center who 
I can't I can't think of his name right off the top of my Patrick head. Patrick Ngamba. No, not not the kid that K State beat out. I think he'll be like a backup. Um, but the other center that they have coming in is uh, supposed to be you know really really special defensively. Might be like the number two pick in the next draft. So um, they're going to be really really talented up front. I think Houston will be a contender just basically because they're running it back minus Jamal Shedd, and they are going to be um, in the market for a point guard. And I'm sure there will be a very talented point guard who ends up on that roster. Um, and once they get that player, it's, it's basically just roll it back. So I, I think Houston's going to be one of those teams that this should be really good. Um, Gonzaga basically has everybody back in uh, Steel Venters, who got hurt early in the year this year. Um, it was, you know, was starting wing for them should be healthy and back. So um, those, those are three teams that are, you know, at the, we're at the top of our, our preseason top 25. And um, I anticipate will be ranked pretty high in the preseason when everybody puts those out. Last thing I've got for you, CJ, and looking ahead, I know your your top preseason or super early top 25. I believe it was six big 12 teams for next year in the top 15. And obviously it's going to be a great league again. I know going into the tournament, though, you had told us you you had some reservations about how the Big 12 would perform in the tournament. Do you think that the conference lived up to the standards you expected from them in March Madness this year? Do you think they still fell short even of that? How would you sort of assess how the conference played uh, in the tournament? Well, considering my expectations were that high, I would say they lived up to it. Um, I thought, you know, good, great, solid year for Iowa State and, and you know, what that team had. Um, as far as its talent to get as far as it went or have the season it had, that was awesome year for Iowa State. Um, you know, I think Houston, if Jamal Shed is healthy, probably makes the Final Four. So that 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 makes the league look a lot better if that's the case. And um, but the tournament's the tournament. You know, a guy can get hurt and it can end your season. So um, I, I think overall the league did fine. Like not great, not not terrible, just, just fine. And, and like, like I said, going in, I just didn't feel like the talent level was what it's been in the past. And, and we'll see what these big 12 teams do in the, in the portal. Um, but there are, you know, in Iowa state and Houston, I think both those teams return a lot and still should be a really good college basketball teams. Are they going to be good enough to win like a national title? We'll see what they add in the portal, but um, I think they'll both be, you know, contenders next season. And, and then, you know, Baylor, Kansas, Arizona, um, some of those teams will, we'll, you know, see what they get in the portal and see how they do, but you know, they could also be up there. CJ Moore covers college basketball for the athletic go subscribe at the athletic.com. So you can check out all of his fantastic work. He's joined us throughout the college basketball season every Thursday for the big 12 breakdown. As always, CJ, we appreciate the insight, all the information, uh, making us sound a whole lot smarter when we talk on the air, we appreciate it. Enjoy the off season as best as you can. And we'll talk to you down the road. All right. Thanks, gentlemen. Appreciate you. That is CJ Moore from The Athletic. Awesome, awesome stuff, as always, from CJ. Really appreciate him joining us throughout the season. We've got one hour left for this shortened edition of 580 Sports Talk, and we'll lead it off with our headlines after the news.
the final hour of 580 Sports Talk. It's a shortened edition of the show today. I'm Brendan Dorzinski. That's Dan Lucero. That's Spencer Dupuy. We're here with you until 6 o'clock. Jumped on today following a Royals win over the Houston Astros. Seven straight for the boys in blue. We'll talk a little more Royals baseball later on in this hour. We'll also get to more on the situation unfolding at Kentucky. Former Wildcat Mark Pope. Might be time to come on down. Man, if you're BYU, you've got to feel like, how in the world did this affect us? Are you kidding me? <laughs> we had a good thing going here. No one expected us to be all that good. Then we are good. And now you might take our coach this late in the cycle? Come on. Yeah, but that's tough. We will get to the latest there here in a moment. We've also got 580 Sports Talk headlines for you. Not a ton of headlines, but the uh, few we have are pretty major. So we'll get to those here momentarily. You are welcome to be a part of the show. On the Top City Metal Supply text line, 785-272-9429. You can reach out and let us know your thoughts and anything we're talking about today. You can also watch the show and comment along on YouTube. Our YouTube channel is called, as you know, 580 Sports Talk. Before we get to our headlines, though, it is time for the 5 o'clock hour keyword for Alpha Media's Choose Your Trip contest. Right now, head to our website, 580wibw.com. There is a link right in the center of the homepage, right on that first screen. You can see a big old picture that just says, choose your trip. Click on that. You'll see the little contest information. Then a section to enter this keyword. Between now and 6 o'clock, your keyword is location. L-O-C-A-T-I-O-N. Location. So go to our website, click on the Choose Your Trip contest link, enter the keyword location. You have until 6 o'clock for that keyword to be active. By the way, we have tomorrow and two more weeks to enter the tri- enter the contest to win the unforgettable trip of your choosing. But why not enter right now? Location is your keyword, active until 6 o'clock over at 580wibw.com. All right, let's get to it. Our 580 Sports Talk headlines for today. The biggest headline. In the sports world, O.J. Simpson passed away yesterday. His family announced at the age of 76, he died due to a battle with cancer that he had been dealing with uh, in recent times. I don't need to explain a whole lot about who O.J. Simpson was. This is not some behind-the-scenes character in the sports world in, uh, in our memories. No, this is one of the truly most unique stories in sports and, frankly, in modern American society. And I really don't think that is overselling all of the different societal aspects that played into the person he was and the trial and who he was after trial, his football stardom, both at USC and then in the NFL as well. In terms of his football credentials, one of the greatest running backs of all time. He had a 2000 yard season, an MVP award back in 1973, a five-time first team all pro pro bowls, all sorts of accolades. He won the Heisman Trophy at USC. He was in the Naked Gun. He was on the NFL on NBC. He was in other things, the Hertz commercials, all of that. He was a megastar. And then he might have killed his wife. And, and a waiter. And a waiter, as, as Norm McDonald would say. Um, look, I... I he led you police guys. on a chase. In yes, the yes, the Bronco chase. The infamous chase. Bronco chase. The, the trial of the century. If the glove don't fit, you must acquit. All of that. I was not alive for the trial. Spencer, I, no. if I wasn't, I know you were not. Nope. Um, I was. I did watch that F, FX docuseries years back. Yeah. The, the I FX, really got into that. The FX series with Cuba Gooding Jr., yeah. I think, was in it. Cuba Gooding Jr., um, uh, David Schwimmer. David Schwimmer, John Travolta, Sarah Paulson. John Travolta uh, in that? Really? Yeah, I never saw was. it. Yeah, I just he remember played, when it came out. Robert Shapiro. Oh, yeah, he did, really? Uh, Sterling K. Brown. Uh, it's really good. It's, it is. It's over the top. I've in, watched it multiple times. Because it's a, a, mm-hmm. a what's his name? Ryan, uh, the guy from Glee. The, the guy who did Glee. Ryan, oh my God. I would not be able to tell you that. No, no, the director. I do not know. Um. Oh, Ryan Murphy. It's Ryan a Ryan Murphy. Murphy production, so of course it's a little bit over the top, but it it's really entertaining and it came out about the same year uh that the uh, acclaimed 30 for 30 documentary OJ Made in America came it came out. out before it did i believe yeah it, i think you might have been right same year but i think yeah, the was, fx show came out first came out the same year and uh i 
recommend both. Uh, the the Made Ameri- in America is incredible. Yeah, Made in America is the best thing. Thirty for Thirty ever did. It won an Oscar, I believe. I yeah, won best documentary. Um, it, it, it's really uh, worth watching. Um, and look, I yeah, like there's no there's no need to sit here and relitigate like the verdict, <laughs> right. why the trial went the way that it did. Uh, everything that happened in OJ's life after that, where he seemed to almost take a bit of pleasure in getting away with murder, which again, we'll mm-hmm. sprinkle the appropriate amount of allegedly on it to cover ourselves, but he got away with murder allegedly and then lived the rest of his life like somebody who had and wrote a book. Yes. Which, yeah. I mean, if you want to, if I did it, you're you're right, Dan. I mean, there's no need to relitigate yeah, a lot of this, but at the same time, I remember it coming out. I remember that part mm-hmm. of the situation, and uh, there was the reality show, there like, were all the podcasts, on. the tweets, the the recasting of himself as like a, a fantasy football expert. This, of course, all came after he did nine years in jail for uh, trying to take back some memorabilia that was his, and maybe doing it at gunpoint and. Uh, was that an overreaction, perhaps, to everything that happened there in Las Vegas? Maybe, but uh, maybe that was also uh, a bit of ball don't lie on the part of the prosecutors in Clark County in Las Vegas. V- within the last hour, the parents of Ron Goldman, who was one of the two victims in mm-hmm. the in the double murder that occurred, uh, issued this statement. The news of Ron's killer passing away, and I'm quoting here, is a mixed bag of complicated emotions and reminds us that the journey through grief is not linear. Through three decades, we tirelessly pursued justice for Ron and Nicole, and despite a civil judgment and his confession, and if I did it, the hope for true accountability has ended. We will continue to advocate for the rights of all victims and survivors, ensuring our voices are heard both within and beyond the courtroom, and despite his death, the mission continues. There's always more to be done. Thank you for keeping our family, and most importantly, Ron, in your hearts for the last 30 years. Ron Golden would be 55 years old if he were still alive today. Nicole Brown would be 64. I I think it's not fair when people say things like his complicated legacy. Nah, man, he probably killed them. Yeah, there's nothing real complicated. <laughs> like, he was a great football player, and he was in some fun movies and commercials. And also, he was a relentless spousal abuser. And because that went unchecked, that allegedly ended the way a lot of yeah. those things do, sadly and, 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 and tragically. And he was, I mean... Go, go go check out. I got it open right now. Go check out Pro Football Reference. I was not old enough to watch OJ play. He retired 15 years before I was here. I, I didn't get to see OJ play. He's one of the greatest running backs of all yeah. time. He that's the amazing thing about it. Like the dude a, as an adult, and if you watch the the documentary, at least the the Made in America. I mean, they do a great job talking about his upbringing and where he came from and why he viewed the world the way he did, at least to some degree. I mean, he had it all, and like so many tragic stories had a lot of demons and a lot of things that he had all the power in the world to stop and then did not stop. And, um, I, I'm not gonna like shed a tear that, oh man, OJ died. Like, no, no I, those were almost uh, Jeremy Schaff's exact words. Jeremy Schaff, of course, covered the trial for ESPN, mm-hmm. uh, gosh, 30 years ago, 30 years ago. Yeah. Well, a, almost exactly 30 yeah, years. Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 uh, the, the, oh, the Bronco chase, uh, which was also um, memorialized isn't the right word. Uh, commemorated isn't the right word either. It was the focal point of a 30 for 30 documentary called June 17th, 1994, which is one of the more entertaining uh, of the early run of 30 for 30s and is also worth watching. Um, that is, yeah, when I mean, we're coming up on the 30 year anniversary of that. And uh, yeah, it was... Uh, I mean, again, there, there, there's not much to say that hasn't already been said, and this is this brings to an end a uniquely American saga. Yeah, in so many ways. A uh, couple of cool comments here, and I, I appreciate everyone who's who's listening and, and following along and, and sharing some thoughts here. Um, from Jeffrey on YouTube, I think this sums it up for a lot of people. Wasn't proven, but my gut says he was guilty. I, I think most people, and again, I can only use the benefit of hindsight, but yeah, I mean, I would certainly say so. Neilio on YouTube says, I was sitting in the K-State Student Union the day when the verdict was announced that he was not guilty. Place uh, had a feeling to it that you cannot describe in words. That's what I've always been told. I mean, my, my parents lived through it. Hearing, remember my mom said she was at work when it happened, and they all gathered around the tiny little TV in the break room or whatever and watched it. And just like you, 
no way to recreate that moment. And um, I'm I'm not gonna do the the ooh, the complicated legacy thing. Like, no, he, no. he probably got away with murder, and the rest of his life, the rest of his now, life was certainly complicated. Like the Las Vegas thing, that was a complicated situation. Mm-hmm. The, the legacy is this. He was a great football player who threw it all away and got away with murder. A, 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 a marvel on the gridiron and a disgrace of a human being, I think, yeah. is, a, no, is probably fair. the best way to uh, 100%. to leave it. And uh, uh, one last time, if you have not watched O.J. Made in America, do, do it. Yeah, do it's, it. It is long. It is, every single minute is worth it. They did an unbelievable job with yeah, it. Yeah, even the uncomfortable stuff, because there is some uncomfortable and very graphic uh, retelling oh, yeah. and, and, Im- and images. But stay with it because, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's worth the watch. Uh, the other big headline in sports today that really doesn't have anything to do with sports. These were the top two stories of the hour on the CBS News. So they're, they're kind of stealing our thunder a little bit. The former interpreter for Los Angeles Dodgers superstar Shohei Otani is facing federal charges related to his alleged theft of millions of dollars from the slugger. And by millions, we mean more than the $4.5 million initially reported. There are reports now that up to $16 million disappeared from Otani's bank account over time. There is a 37-page complaint, USA versus Mizuhara, that outlines the full breadth and scope of Mizuhara's descent into gambling degeneracy and loss. And I'm trying to find a more up-to-date story. That is, uh, that is the, the story that uh, that I clicked on to to open was uh, not. Uh, it was kind of the the short burst. Uh, Mm -hmm. story here. Uh, Federal authorities filed a complaint accusing Mizahara of bank fraud, which can carry a maximum fine of up to a million dollars and up to 30 years in prison. Uh, Mizahara is alleged to have stolen more than $16 million over two years to pay off gambling debts to an illegal sports book. From his best friend and his meal ticket for life! In 2018, Mizuhara helped Otani open a bank account where his angel's salary was deposited. Otani said he never gave Mizuhara control of his accounts, but Mizuhara allegedly told Otani's financial advisors and accountants, none of whom spoke English, that Otani or none of whom spoke Japanese, that Otani had denied them access to the account. So Mizuhara essentially was pulling all the strings. And I know there are a lot of people who are asking the question, how can you not notice all this money disappearing from your bank account? How often do you check your bank account? Um, and how often would you check it if you did not have to worry about whether or not you got the energy bill paid or whether or mm-hmm. not that direct deposit hit or uh, whether or not never your student loan payment came out or whatever it is. When you're talking about monopoly money that rich people make, I could absolutely see that being a set it and forget it kind of thing. Oh, you'll handle it for me. Great. One less thing for me to think about so I can go smack dingers and strike dudes out. Like Mm -hmm. it is entirely feasible to me. Text messages show this story continues that Mizuhara began gambling with a bookmaker in September 2021 and began losing substantial sums of money. I'll say later that year in all the complaint states Mizuhara averaged 25 bets per day, ranging from $10 to $160,000 per bet, some 19,000 bets in all over a span of just over two years. Mizuhara's betting records, according to a spreadsheet obtained by authorities, reflected total winnings. <laughs> oh, they kept it in Excel. They're just like us. Total winnings of $142 million. Wow. He won $142 million gambling. What's the bad news? <laughs> total losses of $183 million, leaving a total net balance owed to the bookkeepers of $40,678,436. According to the affidavit, Mizuhara repeatedly texted the bookmaker asking for more credit. On November 14th, 2022, he texted, I'm terrible at this sport betting thing, huh? LOL. Any chance you can bump me again? As you know, you don't have to worry about me not paying. There was also a text 
just an all time scumbag. There was also we we have to find the text about the uh, the the uh, soccer, the 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 bet in uh, twenty one. I think it is. I'm looking through the complaint. Here it is. On or about September 24th, 2021, Mizuhara message bookmaker two. I've just been messing around with soccer. There's games on 24 seven, LOL. I took UCLA, but they lost outright. Now there is a chance that that is a reference to a college football game, which we know Mizuhara bet on quite frequently. Uh, that would be a reference to uh, what you may be familiar with as the Jake Hayner game. When Hayner led unranked Flor- uh, Fresno State back from a big deficit to beat 13th ranked UCLA 40 to 37 at the Rose Bowl. It may also literally be a reference to UCLA soccer because they lost a game to Portland uh, 14 days before that text was sent. Wow. So, yeah, he, he might have been betting college soccer. Which is true sicko, sicko behavior. There's a couple of things that stand out here. One, a lot of people, and, and both of these comments revolve around the belief that, oh, Tani did this. How much talk was there when this news first broke and then when they had that goofy press conference where he didn't take any questions, where it was really just reading a statement, where everyone, oh, Otani was gambling. Ipe is the fall guy. This is all Otani's fault. More like O tax fraud. Like he is going down. <laughs> Baseball's cooked. Okay. Well, here's the thing about the feds they're not going to protect a baseball player. <laughs> of all the people in America who you could argue, like maybe the feds are, are running some scheme to protect someone, they could not possibly care less about the Dodgers designated hitter. Could not possibly care less. He was not gambling here. This was Ipe Mizuhara who was gambling. This entire time on March 20th, 2024, after the news broke that at least four point five million dollars had been transmitted from Otani's account to the operation of one particular illegal bookmaker, Mizuhara texted the bookmaker asking whether he had seen the media reports. The bookmaker replied, quote, yes, but that's all bull bleep. Obviously, you didn't steal from him. I understand it's a cover job. I totally get it. Mizuhara replied, technically, I did steal from him. It's all over for me. Well, okay, and there's the other part, too, where, again, from the very start of this thing, people were saying, whoa, the fact that he changed those stories quickly, I bet Otani got in his ear and they're going to cut some sort of deal. Or a liar was lying. (laughs) Again, the feds are not going to mess around with this and not get their guy. This seems like a guy who was a liar and a cheat and a scumbag, to say the least, getting in trouble for being all of those things. Can you imagine stealing $16 million from your best friend? Wild. And the guy who is going to have you set for life. It's, it's outrageous to me, utterly outrageous that that could possibly happen. Also, like if, You've got him like communicating with the bookmaker and the bookmaker calls him by name. Like there wasn't, uh-huh. there wasn't an attempt for him to like conceal his identity. He was just flat out stealing money. Mm-hmm. This is uh, one text from June 24th of last year. Mizuhara text. I have a problem. LOL. Can I get one thirteen last, last, last bump? This one is for real. Last one for real. Boy, you would just Ooh, down man, that is horrendous. really sad the bookmaker <laughs> replies done i have the same problem smiley face emoji to be honest with you ippy as long as you can guarantee the 500 every monday i'll give you as much as you want because i know you're good for it because again he just kept swiping money out of otani's accounts that he was managing and otani had other people in charge of his accounts for uh endorsements Mm -hmm. things like that like he had a team uh that was handling all of those deals an agent and a a tax uh, bookkeeper of his own but his salary was just going into one bank account that mizuhara set up and i'm sure otani was just trusting because a lot of pro athletes they they won't touch one of their two revenue streams yeah like marshawn lynch famously lives off of his endorsements he banked his game checks. Gronk, Shaq, both very much the same way. Yeah, th- th- that is that is not uncommon for athletes to say, "Okay, I've got two revenue streams. I'm putting one to the side. I'm not even going to think about it, and I'll and I'll live off the other revenue stream." So clearly, there were there was a separation between the revenue of the endorsements, which Otani makes millions in endorsements, uh, both here and in Japan, mm-hmm. and the salary, which yeah, pretty handsome, a little more than we make combined, times a lot. Yeah. yeah. So he just wasn't thinking about that money. And Mizuhara opens the bank account, 
manages it himself, tells the other people managing his other funds, yeah, hey, don't worry about it. Shohei doesn't want you to worry about this. I've got this. Like Very easy to imagine that the guy who's literally his go-between go for Otani and the coaches, Otani and his teammates, Otani and the media, yeah, he's probably the go-between between Otani and everybody else he does business with. Mm -hmm. And to just say, hey, yeah, don't worry about it. I got this money. Yeah, I got this money. All right, I got a 16-leg parlay on the Turkish soccer league that better hit. I need a certain amount of corner kicks in the Bursa Sport <laughs> game or I'm toast. Oh, my God. It's ridiculous. And the fact that he was talking to bankers saying he was Shohei Otani is just such a dirty, gross move. Yeah, uh, He's going away. It, I don't know if he'll get 30 years. Uh, he, he's going to get some time behind bars. He'll, he'll get some time alone to think about what he's done. Yeah, and uh, if there was any doubt about that, like, he confessed. Like, <laughs> it, yeah. Generally speaking, folks, if you're going to commit, like, large-scale bank fraud, don't confess in writing. Just rule number one. Yeah, don't text it to someone. If, if we learn nothing at all from the saga of Ippy. Did he have a burner, or was it like... Well, let's learn two things from the saga of Ippy. Number one maybe don't bet this much money if yeah. you ain't got it. Number, yeah. and, and if you recognize, A, that you're bad at it, and B, that you have a problem. Mm -hmm. Number two, don't confess in writing. Yeah, I wouldn't do Don't that. confess to crimes in writing. <laughs> maybe just don't do crimes. Yeah. Also, just don't commit a crime. Also, they also uh, went through Otani's text mm -hmm. with Mizuhara. There's no references to betting. There's no references to money. Like, if if they were conspiring yeah. on this, it, we we would know about it. He the, is a victim. The, yes. Yeah, yeah. Otani really is legitimately the victim here. Shohei Otani and Kansas men's basketball victims in the eyes of the federal government. Remember that. <laughs> and and I'll never get old. Otani's not even the only like Kevin Garnett had somebody steal seventy seven million dollars yeah. from him. This happens. It's it's terrible that it happens. And you would think like I think there was a scandal had, in the NFL that happened at one point. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. you're right. And and you would think like. All of us sitting here, and maybe some of you listening along, would think, if I had that much money, I would never let it out of my sight. Probably not, right? You yeah. wouldn't even think about it. Yeah, some some people just don't think about it. The money's not literally not an object to them, the way that it comes to be for so much of us who aren't blessed to throw 100 miles an hour and hit the ball 100 miles an hour. Uh, real quick, Spencer, any headlines for us? Yeah, I'll take it back to one of my headlines from yesterday because I just realized it could be this. there could be a possibility of something happening. ESPN has reached a long-term multi-platform media rights deal with Omaha Productions to extend it into 2034. So we're going to get the Manning cast until at least 2034, uh, along with Peyton's Places, Eli's Places, and other content that they're going to create uh, for ESPN and ESPN+. Plus. But the thing that I didn't think about is we're talking about how like for the national championship ESPN like for the football national championship they mm -hmm. have multiple broadcasts yeah the mega cast yeah well uh we could get in 2027 and 2031 we could get a Manning cast for the Super Bowl because that's ESPN will get their first rights for the Super Bowl that's true so are you a Manning cast cool. watcher uh yeah I mean I'll switch back and forth if there's a guest on that I want to hear I'll switch. I won't watch the whole time. I'll mm -hmm. switch back to the normal cast. I've I've started to like. I I first had it on the whole time, but I've had a I have a newfound appreciation for Joe Buck. Hell Boy yeah! Aiken. I used to not be a fan of them on on Fox, but I think they've untightened the tie a little bit on ESPN. I I'm actually the reverse way. I will watch the Manning cast until they bring on guests, and then I turn it off. I. I love when they're just talking ball and bantering when they're like, oh, let's bring on Jon Stewart. Now nah, I'm good. I will say I, they, I need, need they need to make it not as awkward. It's like you it need to awkward. have them both in the same place. Like you need to have Peyton and yeah. Eli in the same studio. Yeah, it, it is a little janky. There's because then they don't know that. and they're like, oh, well, 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 we got to break in for a break. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Peyton, not the smoothest operator into a commercial break. Speaking of, what a perfect segue. <laughs> we have to get to a commercial break. We'll talk some college basketball. We'll also get to some Royals baseball coming up here in this final hour of 580 Sports Talk.
Shall we get to a quick Masters leaderboard update? Yes. Yes, we should. Um, is Bryson DeChambeau the big golfer? Big Bryson brand. I will tell you what. I don't remember who I said besides Tiger Woods being a dark horse. I don't remember who I picked. Uh, don't worry. I have it saved. It, uh, was, it was not Bryson DeChambeau. Uh, no. uh, you took John Robb. Yeah. Repeat yeah. guy. Yeah. So uh, Bryson DeChambeau, seven under 65. DeChambeau famously said that the course play should play as a par 68 for him uh, when he was at his beefiest a couple of years back. Uh, he had not shot around that good since he made that proclamation, but today uh, he shot uh, three under his self-proclaimed par and seven under for day one to lead the tournament. My one shot over my pick to click, Scotty Scheffler, who was playing the best golf of anybody in the world, came in in 32 to get to six under. He is one shot back. 2016 champion Danny Willett is three shots back at four under par. Ryan Fox went in and uh, came out in 31. Uh, but uh, slowed on the back nine. He finished at three under par. The group of three under that is on the course includes Cam Davis, Nikolai Hoygaard, Tyrone Hatton, and Max Homa. And there's a group of two under that includes Corey Connors, Ben On, Joaquin Neiman, Will Zalatoris, and two others. John Rahm finished today at one over par. Back nine's been giving guys hell, especially uh, in the later groups. Rahm was three over on the back nine today. Uh, other players of note, Tiger Woods is in the red numbers, one under through eight holes as he returns to play uh, at the Masters. Tough day for Gary Woodland, but he salvaged it a bit on the back nine. He double bogeyed 11 and was at six over for a time before scrapping back to three over. Unfortunately, he bogeyed 18, so he is at four over par. Uh, not sure what the projected cut will be. A lot of players still on the course, a lot of players still on the front nine even. Uh, I'm not sure they're going to finish uh, today. Obviously, they had a late start due to some weather. So uh, not sure what to tell you about the cut, but uh, not the day that Gary Woodland was hoping for uh, with a four over 76. Our picks from yesterday, by the way, Dan, you went with uh, Scheffler and Thagala. Yes, my guy, Sahith Thagala. He is a uh, one over through seven. Spencer, you had Tiger and John Rahm. I had Gary Woodland and Victor Hovland. Victor, Victor Hovland one under. Victor Hovland one under. Rory McIlroy is as well. Yeah, it's a really good group. It's a big group at one under, but it includes like some stars. Matthew Fitzpatrick, former U.S. Open champion. Patrick Cantlay's at one under. Tony Finau, that's where he'd be now, one under. Uh, Rhett McIlroy, you mentioned. Hovland one under through 17. Cam Smith uh, one under through 17. Uh, former Masters champion Pat Reed uh, one under through 10. Patrick Reed is a bomb. <laughs> Good to see Shot Tiger have a good day. Good start. Yeah. Again, the the back nine has been brutal uh, on the second half of the day for the second half of the day for those uh, afternoon tea times. Uh, so we'll see how Tiger manages. Amen. Corner coming up, but I mean, if anybody can manage it, he's got five coats, man. Hey, uh, Gary Woodland is tied, but better than Ricky Fowler. Yeah. Ricky oh, one of those guys at least has a major. Yeah, Ricky Fowler, four over on the back, four over overall. Hideki Matsuyama's four over. Zach Johnson, another former Masters champ, is four over. Uh, Bubba Watson's two over. He's still golfing? Apparently. Yeah, I'm he's just, out there? He, he's a range goat. He's, uh, he's a live golfer. Oh. Yeah, well. he, he took the live money. Oh, well, that's uh, probably why I did not know he was still an active golfer. <laughs> Yeah, Bubba notoriously Watson. nice guy, Bubba Watson, too. Everybody loves him. Yeah, by all accounts, yes. Yeah, guy. just a real gem of a guy. Uh, so that was our Masters leaderboard. We'll update you tomorrow as well going into the weekend. Hopefully a better day for G-Dub tomorrow. Tomorrow, we, we will not be dancing or wearing bear costumes. We we, we do not want to face a lawsuit. No, we do not. Um, Shout the out other, to Chris Vernon. We, we got to some of this news earlier today with C.J. Moore of The Athletic. Scott Drew officially this morning said no to Kentucky. I really thought he was going to take it. I thought this was the one job he would leave Baylor for. So this guarantees it is Scott Drew will retire at Baylor unless there is some sort of bizarro scandal, which for all the things I could say critical of Scott Drew, he has never, I mean, there have been some, and the NCAA has not exactly been completely hands off with Baylor during his tenure, but I can't imagine there's any sort of inhumane mistreatment of people going on in Scott Drew's program. He's going to retire with the Baylor Bears. 
I really thought that this was going to be the job. Instead, he's out. Danny Hurley made it official today. He is out. No one's surprised by that. So either Kentucky waits for at least a week to see if Billy Donovan changes his mind when the play-in ends for the NBA playoffs, which maybe by that point, he does decide to take it and change his course and says, you know what? I do want to go back to college, a game I have not been in in over a decade where everything has changed and I have to recruit my roster year over year. By the way, do you remember the reason why he left college in the first place? Um, I don't. Uh, he hated recruiting, <laughs> which probably makes having to re-recruit veterans every year even more appealing to him. I just, you know, just a hunch. Yeah, well, I mean, on the flip side, he did have to watch Tory Craig and Andre Drummond collide with each other, each going for the same off-the-glass alley-oop the other night. Yeah, that was... The entire was internet made the same. Billy Donovan is calling his agent a halftime joke. Yeah. It's, and and it's it hit awesome. every single time. I've watched that play no fewer than 20 times. I did not think there was going to be a more embarrassing Bulls highlight during this portion of my life than Denzel Valentine pulling up and airballing a three in the waning moments of a game in the bubble. Uh, and I might have been wrong. <laughs> I, I really might have been wrong. I do hate Denzel Valentine to this day, though. Um, so he's going to stay at Baylor. Scott Drew is. What is next for Kentucky? You're probably not getting Donovan. Your options now, Rick Pitino, who I would I, I would say forget it. I'm Right now, I am sending Mitch Barnhart to... New York City, and I am saying, Rick, I am not leaving until you get on this plane. Yeah, what do you want? He's got to be the guy. Full, yes. full John Cusack and say anything with the boombox. Yeah, I'm, I'm not leaving until you take the job back at Kentucky, and you know he would take it. Rick Pitino would absolutely take that job. Yeah, he would. You wait out Donovan, you go for Mark Pope, who's at BYU, who's a Kentucky grad. You heard CJ say he loves his alma mater. He loves Kentucky, but is a Mormon and also has a connection to where he is coaching right now. You have to be Mormon to coach at BYU or you, Chris Beard, Shaka. Eh, no, yeah, thank you. It's not real great options. The further away you get. And I think if you're Mitch Barnhart, you have to understand, okay, Scott drew could, I mean, maybe Scott drew wouldn't have won a press conference, but he's a former national champion. You got to understand if you're Mitch Barnhart, if you can't get Rick Pitino, you're not winning the press conference. So forget winning the press conference. Just go hire the best coach you can hire. And that might be Mark Pope in terms of cultural fit, in terms of, you know, a modern offense. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, recruiting to Kentucky is a whole different ball game than recruiting to BYU. But um, I, I honestly, I wouldn't hate that hire for Kentucky. To be completely honest, mm -hmm. he seems like a guy who might coach Kentucky like one day. Like, yeah, maybe like maybe best case scenario for him, for Pope, is they do hire Patino and he does it for five years till he gets to his mid late seventies and then says, yeah, that's it for me. And then it's Mark Pope's turn. There's one name that I didn't mention. Neilio brings it up here on YouTube. Bruce Pearl. Pearl's a little bit older. He's in his mid sixties as well. Personality clash wise. I don't know that he, I mean, the guy can coach. He would take it. Oh yeah. He, oh, he would take it in a heartbeat. Yes. He would. Auburn who? He, he would, would forget about Auburn in an instant. He would say yes before Mitch Barnhart finished asking. Yeah. Do you, do you want the baggage that comes with Bruce Pearl? Because there is baggage. Yes. And if you think, oh, that's behind him, it's been pretty much everywhere he's ever been. There has been some sort of baggage. Not nearly as much at Auburn, but go ask Tennessee. Go ask the Big Ten Conference about Go ask Iowa and Illinois what they think of Bruce Pearl, respectively. Uh, I know Illinois fans decades later still hate the dude's guts um, for the Deion Thomas situation. So I, I don't know. That name has got to be out there. I mean, if you're talking about maybe Shaka Smart, you have to at least consider Bruce Pearl. Bruce Pearl's probably a better coach. I'd hire, like, I as far as, if I'm just taking a guy that I think is going to win at that level, I would I would hire Pearl before I hired Shaka Smart. I think, like I said. I would too. I think Shaka Smart is at his level at Marquette. Mm -hmm. I think that is where he ought to be. And I think he should stay there a long time and he'll win a lot of games and he'll make a lot of people happy because the expectations there are not where they were at the last job he was at before he was at Marquette. And he couldn't meet those expectations. He wasn't a good enough coach to meet those expectations. And following up on this, Sunilio says, you know, that style of basketball is something that would get Kate or Kentucky fans, excuse me, pretty hyped up. I agree with that. That's why the idea of Chris Beard coaching Kentucky is honestly funny. Can you imagine UK fans, big blue nation when Kentucky tries to win a game 
59 to 58, where they've got five star guards trying to hunt charges all over the floor. <laughs> Vomit. Eh, yeah. Like, gross. Yeah. You again, another reason why I think Mark Pope makes a little sense because his offense is modern. The mm-hmm. stuff that he does is modern stuff. Mm-hmm. And you can find even better shooters than your Trevin Nels and, and uh, well, the Waterman mm-hmm. and, and, and Spencer Johnson. You can find better. You're going to get better shooters than that. And those guys are going to be a threat off the bounce. Like the whole thing with BYU, they run great offense, but they weren't going to like go get a hoop, right? They didn't have other than Jackson Robinson, any like real hoopers yeah. out there. They didn't have a, like, great athletes just to, just to put it simple and plain. The athletes you can get at Kentucky running what Mark Pope likes to run, the kind of big men you can recruit and say, hey, you, you've you been watching Nikola Jokic tape mm-hmm. in high school. You want to play like that? Watch what I did with Ali Khalifa, who can't, can't jump over a piece of paper. And now imagine what I can do with you. It's got Diedrich Lawson hops. <laughs> Love Diedrich Lawson. It's a bad situation if you're Kentucky, honestly, because another public refusal by Billy Donovan, which I do think will come. I do not think he would take that job. You're left essentially with Mark Pope, who would give up all of his earthly possessions to go to Lexington, and a bunch of guys who are, frankly, I don't think good enough coaches to to live up to the reputation of Kentucky basketball. That's a bad spot to be in, and why I thought Drew was a perfect fit. But uh, by all accounts, from message board reading and from reading the guys who cover Baylor for 24-7 and some national reports, it really was a big deal that Scott Drew's wife and kids did not want to leave Waco. Yeah. And that they said, hey, we don't want to move to Lexington. They tried to convince him yesterday. They they flew him out. They flew just the family, Sands Scott, from Waco to Lexington and back all in one day to sell them on Lexington. And they apparently still said, we don't want to leave. Yeah. And that, look, I get it. We have heard it from Travis Kelsey. We heard it just the other day from someone who was talking about this. Some It was not. It was Clyde Edwards. Was it Alaire who said this? No, it was Mike Dana. I was listening to what Mike Dana had to say when he re-signed with the Chiefs. And he was like, yeah, I mean, I had options to go other places, but I'm happy. Like, you don't get that everywhere. No. And if you're Scott Drew and you've got everything you could ever want, including tons of money, you're his family, your whole life is there, your kids have never been anywhere else. I get it. I totally get it. And I mean this earnestly. I'm not going to lead this to a punchline because I don't like the guy. Like, I, I truly understand why Drew wouldn't take it. I just... I thought this would be the one. Yeah, I, I think that we oversimplify things and and we think, well, this is this is a bigger job. Mm-hmm. Kentucky's a bigger job than Baylor because they got more banners in the rafters. The arena is bigger. The fan base is bigger. The, the size of the check, the size of the NIL can be bigger. And and sometimes that stuff just doesn't freaking matter. Yeah, like you're still dealing with humans. This is not a video game where there's an interest bar and you just keep adding things until it goes from red to green and boom, you got your guy. Like we're, we're dealing with real people here mm-hmm. and I, I and people who don't need the money, frankly. Yeah. That, that That's part of it. Like what, what is, what is Scott drew going to get at Kentucky that he doesn't have at Baylor? If anything, he's the man at Baylor. Yeah. He he's a man. We know he's a man of very deep faith. Baylor being a, a, a the community that it is mm-hmm. Waco being the place that it is probably feels really comfortable to him in a way that maybe Lexington never would have. So kudos to him for sticking around. It makes the big 12 better that he's sticking around. It's a sigh of relief. I'm sure for fans in Lubbock and Manhattan that they're not going to lose their coaches to a Baylor vacancy anytime yeah. soon. It's going to get very funny for Kentucky in the near future. It already is pretty funny for Kentucky. I mean, I and if they hire Chris Beard, I'm not going to be able to open the mic without uh, laughing. That is, uh, that is all time gross. If they do nasty. that. Yuck. Coming up next, some Royals baseball to get to. Not yuck there. They have been killing it recently, smashing the ball, pitching well. We'll get to it coming up after this on 580 Sports Talk.
Brendan, Dan, and Spencer finishing up a shortened edition of 580 Sports Talk with you. Came on late because of Royals baseball. Seventh win in a row. Swept the White Sox, then swept the Astros. They're back in action on the road tomorrow to start a three-game weekend set with the New York Mets. So we're on from 2 to 5.30 tomorrow. We'll talk to Matt Derrick. Some more Royals baseball. Maybe an update on the Kentucky coaching search. Who knows at this point? Uh, you had a fun stat. Well, David Lesky shared a fun stat on, on Twitter today that really kind of hammered home how impressive this Royals team has been. They're not doing anything poorly right now. I and Well, maybe Nick Anderson could stand to sharpen the command a little bit out of the bullpen. But going into today's game, which, again, I remind you, the Royals won 13-3. to Going into today's game, per the fan graphs statistics, the Royals ranked as the best defensive team in baseball, the second best base running team in baseball, the pitching staff came into today second in the league in earned run average, third in the league in fielding independent pitching, and second in the league in wins above replacement as a staff. That includes the bullpen. The offense is 12th in ru weighted runs created plus, seventh in wins above replacement. So all of the position players, it's the seventh best, most valuable group of position players in baseball. Even the bullpen, middle tier in ERA, but just the bullpen guys, ninth in wins above replacement. And it, maybe that suffered today with Nick Anderson's uh, struggles. But I mean, wasn't that the first run they've given up? Yes. The, in whatever was, inning streak. It was mm -hmm. 19 and a third scoreless innings for the Royals bullpen before Anderson gave up a pair in the sixth today. And then that was it. Uh, Sauer uh, for two scoreless innings. And then Jordan Lyles, Mr. Ninth inning, the most expensive mop-up man in the game uh, with, uh, with a scoreless ninth inning. So this is not in any way right this second a fluke. Now we may look back and and things are getting, things may change, but the way they're playing right now, they deserve this record. They deserve to yes. be the third best team in baseball at 9 and 4. The way they're playing right now, the results they're getting are not fluky based upon the way they're playing. They are kicking some righteous tail. And uh how often have we been able to say that about the Royals since the since the 2014-15 group? I mean, not at all. I, think, I don't think that's anything I've said. I came to WIBW in 2016, so I don't think I've ever been this effusive about a Royals baseball team, maybe ever, in the history of me being on 580 Sports Talk. I think you, we talked about it before. We talked about the first month, knowing what they were mm -hmm. after the first, uh, you know, after the end of April, because they started the end of March. And I think we said, like, what, 14 to 16 games would be a good month of wins for them. Yeah. The, the they're at nine around right now. 500. Yeah. yeah, they're at nine right now. They could win probably 10 more. And if you wanted just a glimpse into what is this team right now, they play really good defense. The starters have played to maybe not quite their ceiling. I think Reagan's has a higher ceiling, but they've played to a higher percentile outcome of what you would have expected going into the year. And they hit the you know what out of the ball. They hit the crap out of it every single time. And that's awesome. That That's fun baseball. That is good, fun baseball to watch. They lift it. They've got a true superstar at shortstop. It's fun baseball. Get on the train. It might not last. This might not be who the Royals are through September. That's just the way it is. But right now, jump on because this is fun. And not every team gets to watch fun baseball. I won't name any names. Coming up on the other side of this break, we will wrap up this short edition of 5 Sports Talk with today's final word.
All right, let's wrap up a celebratory post-Royals edition of 580 Sports Talk with the final word today. First, it is Dan. Royals are playing great ball right now, and uh, they're nothing more fun than watching your team put up a nine spot in the first inning. So enjoy this. Soak this in. A six-game road trip coming up with stops against the Mets and the White Sox. Tell you what, if the Royals can have a winning road trip, then I think we can really start to have a little fun. Spencer? I echo that, and I add shout-out to you for helping me uh, get some furniture in the apartment today. And an update from last night. I have made some progress on the tax okay, return. good. Yeah, Dan, you weren't here to hear Spencer like, oh, yeah, by the way, I haven't done my taxes. You know, I would <laughs> criticize, but I can't. I've been there. I have. I filled them out on, like, April 14th one year. You can get an extension for free. He's yeah. done that. I, I I did that like four years in a row. <laughs> <laughs> Final word for me today. I really am surprised Scott Drew is not currently the head coach of the Kentucky Wildcats. I thought that might be the one job to get him away from Baco. From Waco. I respect the Baylor coach for sticking to what he wanted, what he thought was best for him and his family. Not a lot of guys always do that. They take the big jobs looking for the big, shiny, bright lights. It's not always the right move. I respect him for that. That does mean, however, we have a very, very po high potential for a hilarious hire in Lexington. And I'm not a Kentucky hater by any means, but I will kind of revel in it if they hire a total nonce of a head coach. So shock smart to Kentucky. We're rooting for that one. We're back tomorrow from 2 until 5.30. For Dan Lucero, for Spencer Dupuy, I'm Brendan Dworzynski. We'll join you then right back here on 580 Sports Talk.